Ohioans are still asking, who is Rob Portman? From the Patel studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio. Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Joseph Moss, chair of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. We still have a long way to go, but the 2016 race for U.S. Senate is definitely underway. And a new poll this week tells us why both sides are already attacking each other. It is very early, but a Quinnipiac poll shows Democrat Ted Strickland with a nine-point lead over incumbent Republican Rob Portman. A deeper look shows that Ohioans still kind of like Ted Strickland and still don't know Rob Portman. 49% have a favorable, favorable opinion of Ted Strickland to 38% favorable for Rob Portman. Strickland's unfavorable rating is at 29%. Portman's at 18, which is good news for him. The startling number is five years into Portman's term in office, 44% of Ohioans don't know him well enough to give an opinion. Terry Casey, he's he's in the Senate. He's been in the Senate for several years. He campaigned for Senate. He was in Congress for many years. He was a top official at the White House. Why don't Ohioans know him better? Well, Ohioans have lots of politicians to follow. And here's a little secret. Exactly six years ago, the same polling people had Lee Fisher ahead in several different polls, 11 to 15 points over Rob Portman. So polling right now is not a true indicator, and I would love to have people bet me. I'd like to take their money because Strickland's going to have a money problem. I don't think he can raise $25 million. Portman's already got $8 million. And with that money, you can buy a lot of ads to educate people and remind folks about Strickland's record as governor. But, you know, Ted Strickland was a sitting governor. He won statewide in a big race. He's a stronger candidate than Lee Fisher was, even, even back then. Well, he was, but still, he's also got a little bit of a problem. He's got a very young, smart opponent in the primary that's going to test him and raise some issues. And he's also going to be at an age where Harry Reid decided he was too old to stay in the Senate, and both Metzenbaum and Glenn stopped, stepped down when they were about the same age range. Nevertheless, it's a question about branding, and the early branding is showing some positive news uh, with respect to Strickland, and I think that's a good thing. However, Terry and I, I think, are in agreement. It's just so early in the process, it's hard to tell what might develop. I do want to add something to what Terry said, and that is that I don't think that Strickland necessarily needs $25 million. Um, depends on, uh, he's, he's got the branding, he's got the name recognition, uh, so that doesn't need to be developed, but obviously the message does need to get out, and I think that he'll get the money to he'll do that. He'll get the money. I mean, this is going to be a top-tier race. This is going to be get a lot of money from outside the state. I think Strickland will end up being well-financed. And it, it's good news for him now. I think he's well known because he was the governor, but it's early. I mean, this will tighten up considerably. The fact that the favorability rating was as high as it was, Andy, does it, I mean, the Republicans are pounding on Ted Strickland for all the jobs that were lost while he was in office. He says it was because of a national recession. Does the favorability, relatively strong favorability number attached to Ted Strickland say that Ohioans kind of don't blame him, at least not completely, for that recession and those job losses? Well, there's been a lot of time since that it's passed, so maybe that has given them, given voters more time to kind of reassess and reevaluate everything. Uh, I do think that after he does more public events and after Portman comes out and does more public events, these numbers might even out a little bit. This might be a little bit more inflated towards Strickland's side right now. Back to the money issue, you got to remember that the last Senate race that we had in Ohio, Josh Mandel got a lot of money coming in, and he still lost to sitting Senator Sherrod Brown. So, But to re I'll disagree a little bit with Kathy. When the people nationally look at states and opportunities, there's a lot of other states with better opportunities against opponents who don't have the money. And when you look at Ohio polling, there's a big base that Portman has in southwestern Ohio, which is really important. And again, with millions of dollars, you can both remind people about Strickland's problem and when he was a member of Congress, he basically accomplished nothing. Ted's got to come up with a reason 
why at age 75 he wants to start trying to build seniority and what's he actually want to do as a senator. Well, I will, I, I will defend Strickland on the age issue because if you see him on the stump, he's extremely energetic. And I, I'm not really sure his age, other than on paper, is going to come into play. I certainly think if, when there's debates, when there's stump you know, coverage and all that, I think that he, he's a pretty energetic 70-year. Is that all? And, and Terry, you and I are closer to <laughs> 75, I think, than uh, anybody else in the no, stable. I'm in denial. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you must be. But, but there, there's, the big question is, what's he want to do as a senator, other right. than he misses being in public but Terry, office? Well, the, I think no, the thing I think that, that a platform will be there. It, it, Portman does poorly among independents in Ohio. He's got the Republican vote down, and that's, you know, a lot of that's Southwest Ohio. It's the independents that are still liking Ted Strickland. That has to be worrisome for Republicans, no? Well, but if you go back and look at that same polling from exactly six years ago, Lee Fisher was winning big with independents, uh, and they went away. I mean, a lot of independents, when you look at how well John Kasich did, both uh, in 10 as well as in 14, independents are kind of unhappy with taxes and a lot of other issues. But getting back to that original point, why is he still, why is Rob Portman still so unknown by all those people? Is he not controversial enough? I, mean, I, I think that's part of it. He's not the kind of person that fires up. And actually, if you look internally at some of the polling, a lot of Democrats are not as angry with Portman because he is not that kind of partisan warrior that fires yes. people up. And yeah. Especially since you know his negatives were not very high at all. So people don't have a necessarily a negative view of Rob Portman. I think they just don't know anything about Rob Portman, what he's done in Congress, what you know what he stands for. I just don't think he's made much of an impact on Ohio yeah, voters. And, and two issues that he has been visible on the gay marriage issue, and then most recently, unfortunately for him, the letter to Iran. Okay. Well, and it is interesting because when, during the midterms last November, he was sort of the face of getting these Republican senators elected and reelected, but that still, it was kind of a, a niche group yeah. for him. He was in the hard conservative side. And also among the political class. And let's well. not forget, six years ago was not a presidential election year, 2016 will be. Okay. That same poll shows why many investors, some investors anyway, are spending big money trying to legalize marijuana in Ohio. They think they can win. The Quinnipiac poll shows overwhelming support for medical marijuana, and recreational use for adults is supported by 52% of the Ohioans surveyed. Circulators are now collecting signatures of registered voters to get the legal pot amendment on the ballot. They need to collect about 300,000 signatures. Andy Chow. Is this thing going to win? I don't know. If you look at those numbers, if I was in the pro-legalization side, I wouldn't be very excited about a 52% margin, especially because that's only asking people, if we make marijuana recreational, would you support that? Would you support recreational marijuana? It doesn't add all the caveats that this language adds, 10 and only 10 growing sites, the idea that the oppo opposition is calling it a black market. It doesn't add any of that language. So when you add all these other hiccups to it, I think that even eats away at that small 52% margin they already have. And like, pick up on Andy's comment, the devil truly is in the detail because when people find out and have it in the municipal election year, that's when you're more sophisticated voters. Putting it in the Constitution, limiting what the legislature can do to tax or change, and then giving these 10 millionaires a monopoly, uh, those are the kind of things that will irritate people. Well, they argue, and the amendment does say that after four years, you can add to those list of growers. So they say it's not limited to 10, it's limited to 10 at the beginning because they want to regulate them, but they do say That's you can add on to That's a lot to have to explain yeah. to voters. Yes. Yeah. Now, if they come out with a more straight up proposal of legalizing marijuana, just straight up without this cartel-like you know, language, that you might see more support for it. Yeah, and I, but I think Terry is, cons is, is correct. I think it depends on who the voters are. And Andy suggested, and he is correct, that the types of voters that are likely to oppose this measure are more organic voters. The more, I think Terry Not likes to use the word growing. informed, <laughs> but, but in, in fact, the more loyal voters that tend to be conservative. Right. Now, are, you saying, are you saying older voters, though, Joe? In it, actually, the statistics tend to show that, yes, that they are older voters. Now, so I'm thinking you, 10 Lee, years I'm from Lee, now, I'm a, you're like attorney. us. I'm a, I'm a, you're a, what do you consider old, an older voter? What age and above? Well, I think the statistics identify the older voters as 56 
up. I mean, the same in, folks in who grew up in the 60s when the pop generation them, took off? Some of them. But yes. there's a lot but of. They vote more of, of the ones that are more conservative, go out and vote. But and that's the reason the polling is yeah. different. And there's a lot of people that did those things in that era who've kind of learned and grown up a little bit, and they don't necessarily want it for their kids and grandkids. To that point, the poll showed that 84% of the folks they questioned, 84% said they probably would not or definitely would not use legal marijuana. Yeah. So there's still some, cons obviously, some concern there. Well, and there was a good debate the Metropolitan Club had uh, regarding a person from Colorado and some of the problems. So there's a lot of issues. It's going to be a big campaign. Uh, but historically, these constitutional amendments sometimes start out well. But again, when people find out details, all it takes is one problem to get them upset. A big detail that came out in that debate that kind of stunned me was, I forget the exact number, but I'm gonna say it was around 75% of the legal marijuana or cannabis market isn't edibles. It's not smoking it or taking it as a pill, Kathy. I think, might that give people pause if it's, if they're saying 75% of this market is marijuana truffles that are sold <laughs> like... How's my face right. yeah. Um, yeah, I think so, because I think what you're going to hear, as Terry ta mentioned, is in other states, the issue is who has, who, who gets their hands on this stuff? Yeah. Is it somebody who should legally, would legally be allowed to do it, or is it our kids going to be able to get their hand on it? When you start talking about pot and brownies and truffles and whatever else, then all of a sudden you start thinking about how is it going to be kept away from people that shouldn't have it. And those fruit beverages that they talked about, that kind of concerns it me. drops, because, yeah. Yeah, because you mix in a little alcohol and a little orange juice and people think they're getting their vitamin C, but they're actually getting <laughs> marijuana <laughs> drugs. Yeah, that's understand. dangerous. But that's what does well in the market. That's what's so popular in Colorado yeah. right now is that are these edibles, and that's what everybody's concerned yeah. about too because you can't measure the potency as well. It'll be interesting to watch. Our next topic, first Ohio allowed hidden guns with a permit which required 12 hours of training. Then Ohio allowed people to bring hidden guns into bars and restaurants. Then Ohio lawmakers cut the number of required training hours from 12 down to 8. And, you know, we have not seen a documented spike in gun violence since these changes. So maybe that's why a group of Ohio lawmakers just wants to eliminate permitting and training requirements altogether. Joe Moss? Why? You know, I don't know why. why and actually, I, I looked at uh, some of the history in some of these states. Five states uh, have the same kind of uh, law, Vermont being one of them, but they've never had a law prohibiting your concealed carry. Uh, Representative Ron Hood from uh, Asheville is the one who introduced this particular measure, and uh, it takes it one step further. I think that law enforcement is understandably Concern. I wonder if people realize, people in conceal, that like concealed carry or do such things, that if you're stopped by an officer for a traffic offense, you're supposed to immediately, and I want to say that with emphasis, immediately supposed to tell the officer that there's a gun in the car. If, if it's just, uh, you know, the Wild West, I, I just wonder what might result from well, that. Well, I'm going to make a prediction. This bill is going to go nowhere. nowhere. It's been introduced in the past. Yeah. And when law enforcement yeah. says why they don't like this, and there's some other gun groups that are not happy. Law enforcement didn't like concealed carry to begin with. I was going to say, uh, this isn't I, the first right. gun but, bill But I think this one opposed. has got even more reason. Uh, but my sense, knowing the legislature touching some bases, uh, I would call this one dead on arrival because, like it in the past, it's been introduced, lots of bills are introduced, but I don't think it's going to go well, anywhere. It's, it's tough to kind of ar argue against some of the other aspects of this, which would do away with training, yes. background checks. Yep. Uh, I think a lot of people think that those are common sense stipulations, and this bill would do away with those things. But, you know, a lot of people have, think a lot of the common sense gun regulations get shot down immediately. <laughs> Andy, does this show the power that the far right and the NRA has to even get this talked about? Well, you can see it in other states right now. States like Kansas already passed a similar law. Uh, the difference between the law that Kansas passed and this one that's been drafted so far, the law in Kansas, if you go through and read it, it just struck out a lot of language, just taking out a lot of language of the requirements. This also adds, in Ohio, adds a lot of language, and I think that's going to become an issue, too, where you're adding too much to this already complicated issue. Should we have training and permits for concealed carries, Terry? 
if you'd ask people in a poll, they would say absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now I think the argument that some people, and I know Ron Hood fairly well from when he was a state rep from the Youngstown area before he moved to Central Ohio, he really believes in this. And there are some people that feel the Second Amendment is absolute and there shouldn't be any restrictions. The Supreme Court not, has never right. said that, by the way. The Supreme Court in the two cases, one from 2008 and the other one in 2010, didn't say anything about being able to regulate guns. It just said that the Second Amendment extended beyond the militia argument right. to self-protection. Actually, and it's hunting. legal in Ohio to have a gun strapped on you as long as it's seen and it's visible. It's only concealed carry that's regulated. A lot that's of right. people don't realize yeah. that you can carry it's a gun. Has been. Yeah, always has been. Right. And this would put concealed and and open on the same level. It'd be the same rules for yeah. both. Yes. All right. Spring breaks are over. That means kids are in the home stretch of the school year and those standardized tests, the new park test, the tougher, longer exams tied to the Common Core standards continue to cause anxiety and controversy. State lawmakers are, lawmakers are studying what changes to make to the testing system. Now there's a proposal to let some districts develop their own tests. Kathy Kandiski. Doesn't that defeat the purpose of standardized tests? <laughs> well, some would argue yes. Some would argue that if you're going to have statewide accountability, which Ohio seems pretty intent on doing, that it doesn't make sense to give different tests to different students. Otherwise, how can you measure across? It would seem to be a good argument. That said, there's a lot of concern about these tests. People think that they're taking up too much time at school. Students are getting stressed out about it. It's taking away from instruction time in the classroom. It does seem like we've reached a tipping point where people want to dial back on these tests. So the question is, what are they going to do? Um, the governor uh, included in his budget a plan to cut back about 20% of testing. This was proposed originally by the state school superintendent earlier this year. And then uh, Senator Peggy Lehner, the House Edu or Senate Education Committee chairwoman, is heading a committee that's also studying the issue and is supposed to issue recommendations in the Senate sometime next month. So I think the one thing that we can all count on is that they're going to roll these back, but to what extent? Will they, will they roll the park test back, or will they roll some of the other standardized tests that are also given in the course of the year? I think the, the biggest change is going to be they're going to say to school districts that are already achieving at a pretty high level, you can have more flexibility. But I firmly believe Americans want some degree of accountability, and Americans like statistics. They like to measure Bat, who's got batting scores, who's got golf scores. I mean, you don't like it, but that's part of life. If you can't measure and find out who needs more help, how can you direct it there? And it's not just the statistics and the measurement, but by having a test, you also have a unified standard that uh, the students uh, know and the teachers know what is it that they need to emphasize throughout the year. So I think that's the real value of the testing, not necessarily, but they're competing companies, are they not, in, yeah. in offering these tests? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right now and that's part of the dialogue. Right yeah. now, the park, I think, is on the, the losing side of this argument right now because for a while now, there have been a lot of people, opponents of Common Core, but then there are also a big group of people who are for Common Core. But when it comes to this test, it seems like a large majority of people, whether they like Common Core or not, are against these tests. Well, and actually, I think that's what's moving now, it forward. There's only a small percentage that have opted out, though. It's, in Columbus, it was less than 1% of the, of the parents opted and their kids out. So that's it's been right. a small but vocal minority of it folks actually been. opting out. And it's also important to note that the park exams are for math and English language arts. There's a separate exam that's being used for social studies and, and science. So when people are arguing about this, are they are you know it's not always clear if they're arguing about the park exams or all the tests because they're not all park exams, or if they're just arguing against Common Core. Uh, it gets a little murky. But it's interesting. Talk about statistics. There was a survey that uh, Peggy Laner's group put out. And 80% of the 16,000 superintendents and principals disagree or strongly disagree that the time spent to administer new assessments was appropriate. Well, so they, it's just taking too much time. They got to yeah. figure out a way to dial well, back the well, time. Is that because it's new, though? That's that's, that's always my, my question from the start. Anytime you introduce something new that's harder, 
there's an adjustment period. That's Change is hard. Of, that's part of it, but I think a lot of school superintendents don't like having parents say, why isn't our district doing better? Why isn't this building doing better? So that's accountability. Uh, how are you doing? And of course, the real problem for the schools is a lot of this goes back to the parents in the home environment, which really you shouldn't blame on teachers, but it is a part of the equation. A lot of the teachers that I knew are now retiring. I only know a couple that are in active duty. Uh, so to speak, but I know that what I'm hearing from them is just the time that it takes yeah. to administer the test is taken away from the curriculum, yeah. if you and that's a problem. If you talk to curriculum directors, they say, yes, it does, there are a lot of days that are taken up because of testing, but the actual testing time might be shorter than the test that they're used to. So when a test might take three hours, this one takes an hour, but it's stretched over a longer period of time. So mm -hmm. they, they say that it's, you, like you said, it's newer, and so maybe it's harder to adjust to. All right, a group of state lawmakers, they want to make neat handwriting a requirement of state law, at least for elementary kids. Us adults are off the hook. A bill would require cursive handwriting be taught in all Ohio elementary schools. Students would be expected to print legibly, print legibly by third grade and write in cursive by fifth grade. Kathy Kandisky, when was the last time you wrote a letter, a note, a grocery <laughs> list, anything in classic cursive handwriting? Uh, no one could read it. <laughs> I'll just be honest. Nobody could read it. Um, the new, we'll get back to the Common Core Standards. The new Common Core Standards that Ohio adopted back in, I think, 2010 don't include a requirement for cursive handwriting instruction. And that's new. That's different. So. Um, there's some folks that feel that that's important. In fact, the State Board of Education passed a resolution earlier this year stating their support, even though they adopted the standards without them, that they really do like cursive handwriting and everyone should be able to do it. So this is a common core fight? It could be. <laughs> <laughs> it's Obama's fault. It's Obama's fault. <laughs> Bad handwriting. But I couldn't believe that cursive writing wasn't part of their curriculum. And by the way, this is introduced by my good friend Cheryl Grossman from yeah. Grove City. And good, Cheryl, please. You know, I think it's a terrific idea. I think not only cursive writing, but beautiful cursive writing. Heck, I remember I was taught under the old Palmer no, method. I'm, I'm to be fair. I'm gonna, Nobody's preventing. No, I'm going to disagree with you because let me tell you, we're in the 21st century. I just checked on my iPhone. <laughs> and really what I would worry more about, I mean, cursive handwriting, if you can do it, great. But I think what's more important is kids need to learn how to touch type and compose because they do everything. But it's, well, all, it's all in there. When you talk to psychologists, they say kids need to learn how to write handwriting and print. They need to learn cursive and they need to know keyboarding. They say all three are important to help develop all their skills at once at but an in, early age. But in order of priorities, there's some other things, including reading and basic math and well, consumer skills. We have a reading skills. requirement. No, I, I know, but we are doing very well, well getting there. Listen, there's the third grade reading guarantee and the fifth grade cursive guarantee. Right, right. And well, studies say that if you learn cursive, you can read better. You'll be able to understand what you're reading now, better. Um, Representative Grossman pointed out that there's a study that shows students that take longhand notes, like in a lecture, yes. retain the information much right. better than students who uh, type on a keyboard or on a, a tablet or something like that. So there is there is some study behind this that shows it's beneficial. Um, but it's interesting to me that the state would want to mandate this because as it stands now, it's up to the discretion of school districts yeah. whether to do it or not. I asked my kids today, they said they had it in second or third grade cursive. Now, my question is, wh why cursive? Why not Century Gothic? I mean, or, or Tahoma, or <laughs> well, whatever it is. Well, Mike, the reason the is, Ariel. The, if they go to the OSU marching band and they've got to script Ohio, they've got to have there that foundation yes. work. That was the best comment in the dispatch yes. under your story, <laughs> Kathy. It says, yeah. if we don't teach cursive, we'll have a problem in 20 years when the OSU band cannot spell script you know, Ohio. You know, I should have gotten OSU in that story because it would have really been a lot more popular read, huh? <laughs> so does this go anywhere? I mean, or is it just... You know, yeah, I think, I think it will. So. I think yeah, it so. will. I, I, think it's kind of, I don't think it's very controversial. I think a lot of people support it. The only, the only thing I can think of is, you know, they're kind of a little back and forth on this issue of do we tell schools what to do or don't we tell schools yeah. what to do? You know, next week the state school board's going to revoke that four of eight, or five of eight rule that dictates mm -hmm. how many certain staff people you have. So it's like they take things away, they put things on. How about instruction on. time? I mean, should we really be spending a lot of instruction time on teaching kids how to Absolutely. Handwriting? Yes. Really? I think it's, I think it's an extraordinarily it useful mm -hmm. skill. How okay. much, I didn't study I would not have gotten through law school if I hadn't right. sat on the front row 
take longhand notes. But I mean, fortunately, when I was in high school, I took a summer course in typing or else I wouldn't be oh. able to do that. So, I mean. Did you, it, would you have your typewriter there? And no, but I took a summer course, so I knew how to, so knew to how type. I and, have a typing class in I, high school. I learned to type at age 40. So. But yeah. The teacher used to play the rock station full blast during our typing class. So was, we learned how to type. As long as they don't make adults learn cursive, I think we're okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, got to get to our off-the-record parting shots. Joe Moss, you're up first. Kind of a wonkish kind of thing, uh, Mike. L uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, U.S. Uh, Justices Stephen Breyer and Anthony Kennedy went before a Senate subcommittee and reminded legislators that they needed to uh, engage in sentencing reform. I'd like to suggest that uh, too many people are serving extraordinarily long sentences, particularly for drug offenses. I think in the state of Ohio, we need to do the same thing. Terry. Last week, Mike at this table had the four candidates for mayor and did an excellent job, but it's going to heat up even more this week. Channel 10 Thursday night's got a big debate. There's already nasty direct mail coming out from Andy Ginther against the sheriff, and I think more and more gasoline's going to be put on the fire. This race is really going to heat up. Andy. The governor, Governor John Kasich, was asked if he's going to run for president. He says, give me more time. I want to go to Detroit. I want to go to South Carolina. I want to go to New Hampshire again, see if people really like me, and then he'll make his decision. So it could come in the next two weeks. Okay. Uh, I think there's a much stronger chance he's going to jump in. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to remind people about on these park exams and the tests in general is that Ohio just spent, I think it was about $50 million investing in these tests, and I think that's going to be a big factor that you might see parks stay, but some of these other assessments go away. All right. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. We urge you to check us out online. We can, uh, we're at WOSU.org. We're also found on Facebook and on Twitter and the WOSU public media mobile app. So for our crew here at WOSU at COSI and our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.